looks like it's time for us to get started. Uh, we want to thank, uh, welcome everyone that's here. Uh, we also want to welcome those that are tuning in online as well. Uh, I don't have uh, any additional announcements, but I know that we do have uh, many in our number who are dealing with loss of loved ones and those who have had um, medical procedures, so we want to remember them in our prayers. Uh, this evening, our invitation will be brought to us by Alan Stevens, and our song leader will be Jeff Dixon. And following the invitation song, uh, our students will be dismissed to their classes. Um, in the auditorium, uh, Forrest will be teaching the adult class. Um, so let's get started and let's bow for a prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we are so very grateful for this day, for all the many blessings in this life. We are thankful that you hear our prayers, that you answer our prayers. You're mindful of us, you care for us, you love us, and that you know just what we need before we even ask. We ask that you would be with those that are dealing with the loss of their loved ones, that you would comfort them and the family. We ask that you would be with those who have had medical procedures, that you will help them with their recovery, that they might be able to be 100% again. We know that we fail thee, and we ask thee to forgive us of those times. Help us to be stronger in the future. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Number 500. All three verses, please. <clears throat> O oh, thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me ever to adore thee, may I still. seven. Good evening. On Wednesday nights, our young people are studying lessons out of the book of Hebrews. And if you remember the book of Hebrews, it speaks of better things, and that's the topics that have had some good studies um, from that book. But you know, it talks about a better priesthood, talks about a better mediator, a better covenant, and a better salvation. 
among other things. But a couple of the classes tonight are going to be talking about a better rest. And so I wanted to just mention a few things about that. You know, when we think about rest, we usually think about taking a nap or, uh, you know, a good night's rest. And uh, the issue with that is that as humans, we always, we rest so we can go back to work. You know, we rest and then there's always labor after that. But that's not the way God uses uh, the term rest. And, uh, you know, we first see it in Genesis chapter 2, verse 2. By the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. And so we see there that with God, rest is a cessation. It's a stopping. Uh, it's a halting. And, and it's usually a, a particular work. He's halting a particular work. Now we know that God didn't stop all activities. Uh, we see in Proverbs that you know, the eyes of the Lord are everywhere, beholding the evil and the good. And he, he upholds the creation, he upholds the world. But, but he ceased from that creative work that he was uh, engaged in. Now there's two, uh, two rests that we should think about ourselves uh, that we might think of as, as being better in, uh, for us today. And so the first one is well-known verse in Matthew 11, verse 28. Jesus calls, he says, Come unto me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And so, you know, Jesus there is calling, he's actually calling for us to cease. He's calling for us to cease a, a particular labor. And, you know, uh, you might look at it one way, and he's calling us to cease a, a work that we may not even know that we're laboring in. If you think about Paul in Acts 26, he was talking about his conversion on the road to Damascus. And uh, there he, he spoke with Jesus, and, he's, um, and Jesus said to him, I, I am Jesus, uh, the one that you're persecuting. He tells him it's hard for you to kick against the goads. And now I don't know that Paul thought that he was engaging in hard work, but he was work, engaging in a work that he needed to cease. And so we need to cease striving against our Lord, striving against uh, uh, Jesus the Christ. You know, another, uh, <clears throat> another thing that we might uh, think about in terms of another way we might look at that is in Romans chapter 6, verse 16, another well-known verse, says, Do you not know that when you present yourselves as someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? And so we may be striving for self, we may be striving uh, as a slave to sin, we may be laboring in sin, and that's another, that's, a, that's something we need to rest from, we need to cease, we need to put down uh, and not take up. And so uh, tonight we have that opportunity if, uh, um, you know, if you find yourself struggling and striving against the Savior, or if you find yourself uh, striving for self or, or striving for sin, tonight would be a great time to, to make that right. You know, uh, he says there that we, you know, we cease from a particular work. We don't cease from all works because we read there that we, we turn from working for sin and we start laboring, we start slaving for righteousness. And also in Ephesians uh, 2 and verse 10, it talks about laboring for good works that God prepared for us beforehand, okay? And so uh, we're not, uh, it's not the same as we might think of, of, of no work or, or no activity, but we're ceasing and we're putting down those old sinful ways. We're going to take up a labor of righteousness. But continuing on uh, from that, there's the second uh, rest that we see that we should be interested in and that's found in Revelations 14 13 and I heard a voice from heaven saying right blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on yes says the spirit 
so that they may rest from their labors and their deeds follow with them. And so there, there uh, comes another rest, actually in, in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 4, uh, the writer of Hebrews says, there still remains a rest for God's people. And so we have another rest, another laying down of our work that we can look forward to. And um, it's interesting there that if you think about the, the cessation or the rest that Jesus calls for us to, uh, to engage in, we're to leave those labors behind us. We're not to take them with us. But the future rest from labor those labors will follow, the benefit of those labors will follow after us, and they will, uh, you know, we will get to take them with us. It's, uh, you know, similar to what uh, Jesus said about lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. Don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where they will be corrupted and destroyed, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven that, that they will follow after us. And so, uh, in, I think an in, in interesting uh, topic uh, out of Hebrews, but um, again, t tonight, you know, we have kind of uh, two, two thoughts. Either we're engaging in labor that we shouldn't be engaging in and we need to lay down, or possibly we need to carry on and continue on in the labors that we'll be able to lay down and will benefit us eternally. And so tonight, if you find yourself in the first category, and you know that you've been striving against the Lord, you've been striving for self or for sin, and need to repent, confess his name, and be baptized into Christ, we'd encourage you to do that. Or if you found yourself turning back and not having laid down those works and have taken them back up and need to uh, request prayers of the church, if we can help you in any way, uh, we'd encourage you to do that while we stand and sing. Bow down with sorrow, O oh, eyes that long for sight. There's gladness in believing in Jesus. There is light.
dismissed to class. Once again, good evening. It's good to have in each and every one of you here this evening. Those of you that are joining us by way of the internet, we are also glad that you are here. Tyler has been taking questions that people have given to him over the last three weeks or so and devoting class time to answering those questions. Mickey and I were asked if we would fill in for him while he is uh, absent, and we agreed to do so. Uh, I'm not speaking for Mickey, but I'm speaking for myself, and I may not do as quite a good job as Tyler has been doing, but anyway, uh, we will try to address a couple of those questions this evening. The two questions that I have agreed to take on, number one is why do some people spread false teachings or false doctrines? And the other one was why does the United States cater to Israel if they are still, as if they are still God's people? Both of these questions present a challenge because they're not common questions like questions that we might think of as common. I myself have thought about these uh, in the past, so it's probably something that most of us have thought about, uh, but as I said, these questions aren't the common as some of the other questions that uh, we may be getting. But anyway, I will attempt to answer uh, these tonight. I'm going to focus, first of all, on the first question this evening, and that is, if I can get this thing to work, why do people spread false teachings? What is the reason behind people teaching false doctrine? Are there false doctrines in our world today? Are there false teachers in our world today? So I'd like to look at this question this evening from about three or four different standpoints, things to consider. First of all, the reality of false teaching. Is it real or is it something that someone has just trumped up and make us believe that there are false teachers? in the false doctrines in our society. What do we mean by false teachers? What are the reasons for spreading false doctrine? Why do these false teachers spread this false doctrine? And then what is our responsibility in relationship to these false teachers and to these false doctrines? First thing I'd like for us to look at tonight is the reality of false teachings. Do false teachers exist? Do false doctrines exist? Or is this something, as I said earlier, that people have warning us to believe that they're real when in reality they're not? I think the scriptures very quickly and very thoroughly tells us that false teachers, false prophets, false witnesses and their false doctrines are real. It's not something that has just been imagined. It is real. It is with us today. You know, ever since man was in the Garden of Eden, Satan was the first false teacher. 
Peter refers to Satan in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8 as our adversary. He walks around, roams around trying to seek anyone whom he can devour. His false teaching came in the word or in the form of a three-letter word, not. You go to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 3, you can see that Satan told a lie. Satan was a false teacher because he told Eve that you will not die if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God had told them that they would. Satan came along and said, don't believe God, you will not die. So Satan became the first false teacher. And ever since that time, there have been false teachers with false doctrines. They have been present, they've been active, and they have been destructive to both the physical and spiritual well-being of mankind. Concerning the reality of false teachers, Jesus, when he was instructing his disciples about the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, said in Matthew 24, 23 and 24, Then if anyone says to you, Look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, the elect. First Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, the Apostle Paul told Timothy, he said, false teachers are going to be in the last days. And we're in the last days now. The Spirit expressly says that in latter times, the latter days, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. So they have gone out into the world, John tells us. False teachers, false witnesses, false prophets are as real today as they were back in the time of Moses and the children of Israel in the Old Testament. Peter told the saints in Asia Minor that there were false prophets among the people, talking about people in the Old Testament, and even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. So Satan was the first false teacher. Christ talked about false teachers. And we also see that Peter tells us, or Paul tells us, that in these last days that there will be false prophets. So Peter said there were false prophets in the Old Testament. Furthermore, he told them that there will be false prophets and teachers among them. In 1 John 4 and verse 1, many false prophets have gone out into the world. So what John was telling the saints there was that they are real. If you remember, you read on down and further on, and he talks about the fact that even some of their own brethren used to be their brethren, but they have left, they have become false doctrines, false teachers teaching false doctrines, and now they have gone out into the world. John, of course, speaking to the elect lady and her children, said in 2 John verse 7, for many deceivers, it's another way to describe false teachers, false doctrines, have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh, this is a deceiver and an antichrist. You know, John was probably talking about a group of false teachers known as Gnostics. Some of the different sects of the Gnostics, of course, were the Docete, uh, the Serinthians, even the Ebionites. Uh, they promulgated the doctrine that Christ did not really come in the flesh, nor did he die on the cross. It just seemed like he did. Perhaps he was even including the Serinthians. The Serinthians were followers of a man called Serinthius. And he taught that Christ 
descended upon Jesus when Jesus was baptized and that Christ left Jesus whenever, Christ, whenever Jesus was on the cross. That during that time that he was with Jesus, well, that Christ was with Jesus, he helped to guide Jesus in his ministry and help him to perform miracles. But as I said, at the crucifixion, Christ left Jesus. Uh, the Ebionites maintain that Jesus was not born of a virgin, that he was a mere man, that he was the biological son of Mary and Joseph. And we know this to be false because we have the scriptures that tell us differently. So anyone who promulgates these doctrines are false teachers. It's not hard for us to find false teachers in our society today. We can read written materials in the library or just about anywhere we can get a hold of written materials. We can listen to the radio to, uh, and television to these televangelists, or we can even surf the Internet, and we can be exposed in a matter of minutes to numerous doctrines that are false. We can even ask the common man on the street to tell us what Jesus meant by a certain doctrine that he taught or what the apostles meant by a certain doctrine. And we get all kinds of different ideas, things that are so diametrically opposed to the scriptures till it almost makes you sick at your stomach. So false teachers are real. They are with us today. And you know what's even sad, on a, more so on a, a sad note, is the fact that we even have false teachers in the Lord's church today. That's why it behooves each and every one of us to make sure that we study the Word of God so that we will know how to distinguish between false doctrine and the truth. So false teachers are a reality. Well, what are false teachers? False teachers or false prophets or false witnesses all mean the same thing. In Matthew 24 and 24, Christ uses the Greek word for false witnesses or false prophets to mean those who act like they are divinely inspired speaking falsehoods or lies when they give testimonies. According to Vine's Expository Dictionary of the New Testament words, the English word false refers to false witnesses as we see in Acts chapter 6 and verse 13. The AV translated as liars. The New Living Translation renders it as the lying witnesses. These witnesses are liars. They are speaking false or untrue things. False teachers then are individuals who lie. They teach things that are not true. It also applies to anyone who is teaching something that's not true as concerning the Word of God. In Proverbs 14 and verse 15, the wise man of old said that a faithful witness does not lie, but a false witness will utter lies. In Proverbs 16, 6 through 19, Scripture tells us there are seven things that God hates. These things are abominations to him. In verse 19, he lists one of those abominations as a false witness who speaks lies and one who sows discord among brethren. So these false teachers are lies. They spread false doctrines. Why? What's their motive in doing this? Why do they do it? Why do they persist in teaching false things? Don't they know that they're going to be found out? Don't they know that there are people that know what the Word of God says? 
So why do they do it? I think there are a number of reasons. I'm only just going to give a few this evening because of time. But there are a number of reasons why they do this. The first reason is because of willful deception. In other words, intentional fraud. They mean to do it. That's their intention is to fraud people, to deceive people. You know, in Jeremiah 14 and verse 12, the Lord said, I would consume them by the sword and by famine and by the pestilence. Well, now Jeremiah then tells God that the false prophets had told the people that he said they would not see the sword or famine, but would have peace. And God's response was, Jeremiah, these prophets prophesy lies in my name. I did not send them. I did not command them. I did not speak to them. They prophesy a false vision and deceit. So these false prophets willfully and intentionally deceive the people by lying. In Proverbs 12 and 17, again the scripture says, He who speaks truth declares righteousness, but a false witness deceit. And we know that there are many people in, the, in our world today and even in the church that try to deceive us. Try to make us think something and believe something that's not true. They pervert the scriptures, and in the end, they rest the scriptures to their own destruction. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 13 through 14, the scripture says, But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse. Doing what? Deceiving and being deceived. So one of their main reasons is to deceive us. And there are many reasons why they are out to deceive us. The second thing that, or the second reason why false prophets exist and why they continue to teach false doctrines is because their subjects have itching ears. There will always be individuals who have itching ears, or in other words, they have desires to have one speak smooth and comforting words to them. There will always be false teachers who will be happy to scratch those itching ears, and they love to do have it so. These individuals want teachers who appeal to their own desires. They want someone to condone their behavior or to condone or to agree with them on their ideas and on their, their wants and desires and so forth. If someone will agree with them and take their side, and I'm sad to say maybe in even some cases, even if it's wrong, they seem to overlook that because they are pleased. They are encouraged in that someone else has agreed with them. They do not like things that are uncomfortable or make them feel uneasy. They would rather hear lies that make them feel at ease than to hear the truth that makes them uncomfortable. I pity those individuals. There will always be those who will itch the ears of others. Paul told Timothy about these individuals. In 2 Timothy 4, verse 3, he said, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts, will heap upon themselves teachers having itching ears. So these false teachers teach because they, they know there are people that they can scratch their ear. These people have itching ears. On one occasion, the Apostle Paul visited the Areopagus in Athens. Scripture tells us in Acts 17 and verse 21, the philosophers... For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear something new. There are always people who want to hear something new. There are always people who want to tell something new. And then there are always those people that have itching ears that will always want to hear something new. These philosophers at Athens provided a stage 
for any false teacher to espouse his doctrine. They desired to hear some new thing. Regrettably, there are those today that have itching ears for new and different things. Many will not proclaim nor listen to the whole counsel of God, as we see in Acts 20 and verse 7, because it will convict them and make them feel uneasy. So not only do these false teachers continue because of willful deception and because their subject have itching ears, but they also continue because of ignorance, because of their ignorance. But you know, there's two sides to the coin. Not only are they ignorant or misled, but there are people who are ignorant and misled. That's why, brethren, we should not be ignorant or misled if we study and learn the scriptures as we should. In 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 34, Paul tells the the saints there to awake to righteousness and do not sin. For some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. It still should be our, to our shame if we don't have the knowledge of God. It's not hard to get a Bible, either electronically or in, in paperback or anything else. We need to spend more time studying the Word of God so that it won't be to our shame if we are accused of being ignorant. They were unlearned in the knowledge of God. Their limited knowledge was the catalyst for their own deception as well as deceiving others. And that's what we open ourselves up to. We open ourselves up to being deceived by false doctors, false teachings, and false doctrines if we're not educated ourselves concerning the scriptures. When one lacks knowledge of the scriptures, we become a sitting duck for these false teachers. It's more easy, easier for them to deceive us. And that will be like the individual that's described by Paul in Ephesians 4, 14 and 15. We're tossed about to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. This is why one of the reasons that Paul, Peter's instructed the, the saints in 2 Peter 3, 17 and 18 when he said, Ye therefore, brethren, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. So how do we defend ourselves against being carried away by the error of the wicked. We grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's how we defend ourselves from being carried away into error by the wicked individuals. So ignorance on the part of the false teacher and also ignorance on the part of the hearers are those that the false teacher is talking to. Another reason why false teachers can continue to teach is because of profit. They profit from their false teaching. False teachers long after honor, reputation, even though they tell us they don't or they try to present a humble uh, atmosphere. Physically speaking, they are well provided for. Look at, the, you can go online. I went online. You can go online and you can look up the 10 richest evangelists. And they make in the millions of dollars. They're worth millions of dollars. Why do they do that? Because they profit from it. Because of what they have and what they can get. One can access, as I said, the internet. They're worth anywhere from $3 million to $750 million. It's getting close to a billionaire. In the Gospel of John, chapter 2, we read of Jesus entering the temple and driving out the money changers. And Jesus explains his actions, and he says in John 2, 16 and 17, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. 
And that's exactly what a lot of these televangelists have done. They have made the Lord's house a house of merchandise. Jesus was reminding the people that the temple was God's house to be used for worship, not to teach false doctrine, not to deceive people, not to scratch people's ears, itching ears, but to worship God and not to make it a house of merchandise. By the same token, God's word is his power unto salvation, Romans 1.16. To pervert the gospel for one's own gain is diabolical, and it nullifies the power of God unto salvation. False teachers do to God what David said his enemies did to him. In Psalm 56 and verse 5, they twist my words. Their thoughts are against me for evil. Peter describes these false teachers exactly whenever he said in 2 Peter 2 and verse 3, By covetousness they will exploit you with deceptive words. How true. So not only do these false teachers continue to teach false doctrines because they are trying to fraud us, because they are scratching itching ears, because of ignorance and because of profit, but also because this is Satan in action. In John 8, 44 and 45, you are of your father the devil and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources for he is a liar and the father of it. In other words, he's a false teacher. He's a false prophet. He's a false witness. And his servants are the false teachers that are going out and spreading false lies, false doctrines, and are becoming false witnesses. They exemplify Satan by their work. Just as he deceived Eve to cause her to sin, he continues to deceive man today because of false witnesses and because of lies. Jesus told the Jews who wanted to kill him that they were of the devil, for they had his temper, disposition, and spirit. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 through 15, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder. For Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is of no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. So Peter describes the activity of the devil in 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9, when he says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Like the devil, false teachers are seeking whom they may devour. As I said, there are many other reasons, but these are, I think, will suffice for our lesson this evening. Now, since we know that false teachers exist, since we know that a false teacher is a liar, a person who spreads lies, false doctrine, and so forth. And since we know why they do it, what is our recourse? What is our response to false teachers? What are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to act? Are we supposed to do as Daryl Royal described to a reporter one time. Darrell Royal was a coach at the University of Texas a number of years ago. And he was known for his ground game and he didn't employ the pass very many times in his game plan most of the time. And so a reporter asked him once, why was that so? Why do you not use the pass very often? And he said, the reason I don't use the pass very often is because there are three things that can happen when you make a forward pass, and two of them are bad. It's either 
incomplete, it's either intercepted or it is completed. So our response to false teachers, three things we can do. We can either condone them, we can either reject them, or we can become passive and do nothing. And actually, when we become passive and do nothing, we're actually condoning them. We're, we're actually giving them an easier time to continue their teaching of their false doctrine. But what is our response? What are we to do? We know that many of them selfishly profit financially from their false teachings. Is there anything we could do to protect ourselves from them? I suggest that there are some things in th that we can do and must do. Number one, we need to thank God and take courage. You know, when you look at Acts chapter 28 and verse 15, the Apostle Paul is a great example of this because he says in Acts 28 verse 15, and from there... When the brethren heard about us, they came to meet us as far as Apai Forum and three ends. When Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. Now, Paul and his traveling companions were traveling from the port city of Puteoli on his way to Rome. He was met by his brethren from Rome at two different resting stations. One of them was the market of Apius, and the other one was the three ends. When he experienced his welcoming, he thanked God and was encouraged. He got strength. He received strength to continue on to his journey to Rome. Brethren, I suggest that we need to do the same thing. We need to thank God and we need to be encouraged because God has given us his word because the truth is in his word, as Jesus said in John 17 and 17. We can be encouraged to know that we have the truth and that we are able to distinguish it from false teachings. We do not have to be enslaved to evil in the form of false doctrines or false teachers. Instead, we can be free because of the truth, John 8 and 32. So we need to thank God and we need to take courage. Next thing we can do is that we need to be aware of false teachers and their teaching. In order for one to take the proper actions against these false teachers, we must be aware or we must pay attention to their pretense or their presence and their actions. We need to pay attention. We need to notice. We need to take care that we don't just pass them off and, and like we're in an oblivious condition and don't even know that they are around. They are around, and we need to know that. We need to be aware of that. We cannot like, be like the proverbial ostrich and bury our head in the sand when it comes to these false teachers because they are a threat to our spirituality and ultimately, they are a threat to our destiny. They won't just go away if we leave them alone. And Jesus admonished his audience in Matthew 17, verse 15, and Matthew 7, verse 15 and 16, beware of, or in other words, watch out for, false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. Matthew 16, 6, Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Colossians 2, 8 and 9, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. So we need to be aware of these false teachers and their teachings. How do we become aware of their false teaching? We have to know the false teaching and we have to know the Word of God. If we don't know the Word of God, the Word of God is the test. I think it's in 1 John 4 and 1. We need to test every spirit. 
We have to test these spirits so we'll know whether or not they are from God or not. And that brings us to the next point. Test the false teachers. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God because why? Many false prophets have gone out into the world. You know, in Hebrews 4.12, it tells us the, the test that we are to use. We don't make up our own test. We don't take the test of someone else that's made up. We have to use the test that God gave us. And just as a test is given to see if a person really knows and understands what they're talking about or what they're supposed to know, wise Christians will test every spirit so as to determine whether they are from God. Where do we get the test? Hebrews 4 and verse 12. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow. doesn't stop there, but it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You want to test the false prophets? false teachers, lying witnesses to see if they are telling the truth or not? Use the test. Use the Word of God, the Scriptures. It will let you know whether or not they are true or false. Not only are we to be thankful and take courage and beware of these false teachers and their teaching and to test these false teachers, but we are to resist them and their malicious doctrines. Ephesians 4, 27 to 28 says, And do not give the devil an opportunity. When we embrace false teachers, when we take a passive attitude towards these false teachers, we're giving the devil an opportunity. We're giving that door open just enough to let the devil get his foot inside and that's all he needs. James 4, 7 and 8 says, James commands the saints in uh, James 4 and 7 and 8, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, is James saying that once you resist him, he's going to flee from you and you don't have to worry about him anymore? We know better than that. We know that, as Peter said in 5 and 18, 1 Peter 5 and 18, He's roaming, walking around, seeking whom he can devour. He's not stopping his roaming. He's not stopping his seeking to devour us. But when we resist him and resist him, he will leave. He may come back later. We resist him, he'll leave again. So how do we resist false teachers and their doctrines? We must not entertain them. If we yield to these false teachers, we are giving Satan an opportunity. Ephesians 6 and 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You know, he has a lot of fiery darts that he throws at each one of us every day. He's constantly shooting these fiery darts to see if he can hit, hit us. We have to put on the whole armor of God so we can defend and reject those fiery darts. Then the next, last thing is that we need to stand firm in the faith. 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 9, Brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. And then, of course, do not bid them God's speed, 2 John 10 and 11. You know, the saints in that day, uh, they had, I guess, traveling evangelists, people that would go from place to place and, and teach and preach. Now, oftentimes they had a hard time finding accommodations. And so people would give them room. They might feed them. They might give them supplies to go on their way. And John is not saying that we cannot be hospitable. But what John is saying is that if we do anything to encourage and to help those false teachers to continue to do their false teaching, then we have become partakers of their evil deeds. And then, of course, we need to take heed unto ourselves. We need not to forget 
that we are vulnerable to these false teachers. That we need to guard against these false teachers. That we need to study the Word of God. 1 Timothy 4, 16, 2 John 9 and 10. We need to take heed to ourselves. We need to make sure that we are rejecting these false teachers and these false doctrines. The last one I had, uh, and I, I didn't think I'd get to this, was why the U.S. caters to Israel. I'm just going to try to sum this up in the next minute or two. Uh, basically, what this is saying is that uh, the evangelicals, or the Christians, as the world uses the terminology, uh, believe that the United States' obsession with Israel as if they were God's chosen people has to do more with prophecy than with politics. And what they're saying is that the Bible's story uh, of God's involvement in the past it serves as a blueprint for the future. And they're also saying that what was for the the Jews in the Old Testament, it has a future application also. And when you go back and you look at scriptures, uh, the promise God made to Abraham, the fulfillment of the promise, the time of the, of the promise and so forth, we know there was a land promise, there was a promise of nationality, and there was also a spiritual promise, and that was that Christ would be the seed, Abraham's seed, through which all nations of the earth would be blessed. But what we're seeing here is the fact that when we look at certain scriptures like Joshua 21, 43 through 45, and I encourage you to read that, it says that the Lord gave to Israel all of the land which he had sworn to give to their fathers and took possession of it and dwelt in it. This is past tense. It doesn't have nothing to do with the future because this has already happened. Uh, the Lord gave them rest all around and so forth. Not a word failed or any good thing which the Lord had spoken to the house of Israel. All came to pass. Uh, in Deuteronomy 1 and 10, the Lord your God has multiplied you and here you are today as the stars of heaven in multitude. These things... Uh, as I said, or in the past that have already happened. Now, if there is a future to this, if, if Israel is supposed to return to Jerusalem and they're supposed to have a national power again and so forth, then there's a couple of things that doesn't quite add up. First of all, when Abraham's prosperity left Egypt and entered into Canaan, it was for naught because it was too early because the future hadn't gotten there yet. Also, when they left Babylon and returned to their land, it was for nothing because they're still waiting today. So the reason the United States uh, seems like that they catered Israel as if Israel or the Jews were God's chosen people is because there's a misunderstanding of the prophecy. The prophecy that God made to Abraham has been fulfilled. It was fulfilled back in the Old Testament times. It was fulfilled when the children uh, took possession of the land. It has nothing to do with the future, but here again, false doctrine says it's for the future. Thank you for your patience this evening, and uh, hope I gave you something uh, that you could understand and use. I appreciate it. I guess that was the second bell, so be careful on the way home, and Lord willing, we'll see you Sunday morning. <laughs>